Welcome to episode 231 of CBP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Burving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how's it going today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Any uh, any big updates from you? Nope. Just uh, working along and figuring out what this year's going to be like still. Yeah, still early. Still uh, a lot of planning to do, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we can jump right into the feedback then. Uh, we got this tweet from uh, Ran Rajiv, who I believe we uh, both met at SubiCon last year. And he writes, thank you, Rob and Jason, Phil, Fred, and Adi for making me laugh out loud in public in some parts of the show. Really good way to start the weekend. Thanks again. So, yeah, I definitely uh, enjoyed this episode uh, last week. So um, I hope uh, other listeners did as well. And, uh, yeah, glad we were able to make someone laugh. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cbcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Sean Baxter. Sean is an independent programmer and the author of Circle, the next-gen C++ compiler. He formerly worked at DE Shaw Research, NVIDIA, and JPL. Sean, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm kind of curious, when you worked at JPL, like what uh, major, I mean, you know, were you working on any Mars rovers or anything like that? Uh, no, I was debugging Fortran code for atmospheric gradative transfer or whatever they have programmers do. I mean, if you okay. know how to hack code, they'll, they'll put you on stuff they've been t- maintaining since the 80s or longer, and there you are. And so people move through that. You know, you go in, you're like ready to do science and... You, you might have some exposure to that, but ultimately you move through as a programmer. It's just not a place that, that retains, I don't think, programming talent. So That's unfortunate. I mean, there's have historically been lots of interesting things that have happened there. Yes. Agreed. Do, like, newer projects, are, are they also coded in Fortran, as far as you know, or is it just maintaining the legacy stuff that's in Fortran? So... I mean, mo- most of the code is written by scientists who work in the language of their advisor. So there's people my age who are Fortran 90 programmers because their their advisor was some you know renowned atmospheric chemist, and they have they inherit you know this this person's uh, research, which is really like a, a Fortran package, and so they keep keep running with that. And you know, I've, it's been like I guess 10 years since I left there, but um, yeah, you know, there are people in their 30s who were you know dealing with Fortran. So um, I'm not I'm not saying it's bad on its own because I mean Fortran is honestly fine if you're just you know doing data manipulation, but it's it's hard to find um, you know ordinary programmers who aren't domain specialists to come in and work with you and accelerate it. So I spent a lot of time trying to um, you know port some stuff into C, you know um, get it to run quickly. It's easy to make you know a thousand or ten thousand times performance improvement over someone's Fortran code. Not because Fortran is slow, just because you, you know, when you're a real programmer, you understand things like memoization. I don't have to, you know, if I, if I already know what the answer is, be, I can cache it and store it and retrieve it later. And there's lots of, lots of things you can do um, that, don't, that don't occur to people. So I, I think it is good to get their, their projects in newer languages, but it's not unusual for domain specialists to be using antiquated tools. Right. So it falls in line with uh, what I've seen with some of my training lately is companies, organizations moving from Fortran to C++ simply because it's hard to find good Fortran programmers today. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good like, reason to move. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Sean, we've got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and we'll start talking more about Circle, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, this first one we have is a blog post the hunt for the fastest zero, and this is on the Performance Matters blog, which I think we had another blog post from them somewhat recently. I think you're right. And yeah, and uh, yeah, this is interesting. Uh, someone wrote a you know method just to fill a char array with zeros, and you can get 30x improvement by using the char slash zero instead of just the integer zero. And they dug into it, and it's because of uh, you know template specialization. Template specialization specifically mm-hmm. with lib standard C++, GCC standard library implementation. Right, yeah, this, this test is all with GCC. Yeah. Apparently, lib C++ from LLVM doesn't suffer the same drawback. Okay. 
And did, did okay. he go into why? Or what did they do uh, differently to avoid honestly, this? Yeah, I don't recall. I read the okay. article a few days ago now. Well, anything uh, uh, interesting you got out of this one, Sean or Jason? Uh, use Memset, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just use no. Memset. Use your optimizer. Cause they were, they were using the optimizer on GCC. Uh, yeah, but it's, it, he uh, qualifies it. It's after... It's O... Uh, okay, so at O three, then it goes. The both versions go to Memset, but oh. at O one and O two, it doesn't. Right. I knew it was at some point that it mm. did. It did ultimately. Okay. Uh, next one is we have this uh, paper submitted to the ISO committee, and this is two D graphics: a brief review. And I I'm not familiar with this author, James Barrow, but he. Went over the entire uh, 2D graphics proposal and made a number of, you know, conclusions and recommendations about things that uh, the author, you know, suggests should change. And it seems like very constructive feedback uh, is, is how I looked at it. I didn't read the entire paper because it was quite long. Um, I was just going to say I take issue with a brief review, but... Uh... Well, he if you just skip ahead to the conclusions and recommendations, uh, he, he does itemize all of his, his main takeaways and recommendations for the paper. Well, the, yeah. the original paper is like 300 pages. Yeah. Which is yeah. why I don't think you should re try to refute it point by point. Um, <laughs> it's a weird thing to put into the C++ standard. I mean, there's nothing in the past 40 years of software that's evolved faster than graphics. And like, what are you dealing with now? Ray tracing hardware, augmented, um, like head mounted displays, augmented reality. Yeah. Um, there's so much technology, and like the the graphics TS is basically like GDI. I mean, it's like 1990s ideas of paths and pens, pen widths and brushes and things. Like, I mean, that was useful back then because there was no RAM and there was no bandwidth to do full color graphics. And now, if you're doing, you know, a 2D game, even you can provision 50 auxiliary buffers that run on GPU, and you can have hundreds of layers of post processing and all this capabilities available. And I don't I don't know why they'd want to take a um, a graphics library, which should be fast moving, and then slow it to a crawl by forcing it to go through ISO standardization every three years to get new updates. It's like the weirdest thing yeah. to hamstring like that. That's yeah, a... I, I can't disagree with that take. I mean, I, I do think, and I think one of the recommendations in here was to kind of break it out into smaller proposals like linear algebra, which I believe is, is being done. Right. And those things, you know, could be standard standardized and don't need to be as fast moving as the entire, mm -hmm. you know, graphics library. So, yeah. I personally found the dissection of the RGBA color type uh, interesting, as like pointing out how it doesn't do the operations that you would expect it to do, and behavior is different whether you uh, multiply by an integer or a floating point type or. Mm -hmm. And then this little note here that says, and oh, by the way, all software libraries do color wrong on purpose. <laughs> Did you read that? No, that, could, that, part. that could become like an all day long rabbit hole. Um, let's see. It's talking about how CSS does it intentionally wrong. Yeah, CSS deliberately handles linear color incorrectly because they do what we all expect it to do, not the actual like physics of color, basically. Hmm. And apparently it's, like, a thing that Are you talking talk about, about, like, which color space you want to interpolate in? Like, red, green, blue channels versus hue, saturation, brightness, that kind of thing? I believe... Give you, I mean, different ways to average colors, but... No, 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 yeah, it's not just different <laughs> ways. It's that it's deliberately wrong uh, because uh, if you increase the values linearly in the RGB space, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't actually increase the brightness, perceived brightness, in the same uh, to the human eye, and that there should be like a curve with gamma correction and stuff like that. Or that's, that's uh, I got lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a linked article from the paper that talks about all of this, which then links to another article which talks about more detail of the things. And I decided I was spending too much time going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and then the last thing we have to mention is, and uh, I, I definitely do not go over all of these, but the pre-prog uh, ISO mailing list is out, so you can take a look at all the papers that are going to be presented at the prog mailing, which I think is next month, or is it the end of this month? Uh, it's it's in February. It's in February, yeah. So yeah, if you want to take a look at all the papers that are going to be going over at the uh, the next meeting, they are all here. And I think there, there's still going to be some bug fixing for C++20 going on at this meeting, or are we past that? You're giving me a funny look, Jason. Oh, no, I just noticed uh, a paper in the mailing that I had not noticed before, so that funny look was not directed at you. Okay. I believe this is the last opportunity for... For bug fixing. I believe so. But they'll but probably also wrong. start to actually look at some of these papers for uh, 23. Yeah, I... Um, I need. I'd have to look at the timeline. Sorry. So Sean okay. here is just for the record. It directly mentioned once and indirectly mentioned at least once in this mailing. No, I'm. I'm. Well, the the don't context for all the things is a circle mailing. Yes. Yeah. And, and the, then. And, yeah. There's <clears throat> another one. Uh, that's the circle meta meta model. Yeah. There's a pro in the con sides. Oh, okay. So maybe we'll talk more about that once we actually get into the interview portion. Sure. Is there anything you want to highlight before we get to that, though? I saw that uh, Titus updated his ABI paper. I wasn't really sure what changed in it, though. I didn't read uh, that. I was focused on the context for papers that I had not yet seen. Um, anything notable there that you wanted to mention? Uh, some C header library const expert proposals. Um, David Stone's revision, second revision of his paper on fixing the inconsistencies between const expert and const eval, which I did not appreciate the first time I read this, what the problem was. The second time reading it, I do. So there's that. Um, basically, a const eval function must be evaluated, even in unevaluated context which then breaks some things. So he wants to just basically cross out a single line saying that a, a const eval function doesn't have to be evaluated in unevaluated context. Um, hmm. Then I get the arguments for wanting to change the scope of const expert if, which is probably a talk all by itself because it's been an ongoing argument if you follow these things on Twitter between like, Andre, Alex and Trescu, and the rest of the C++ world. And there's a paper here um, about reducing the scope of const expert if. Uh, but I am just so opposed to anything that actually has an if block where the scope is outside of the if block. Like, that just does not work for my brain. But I don't know if that's worth going into. How about you, Sean? Anything uh, you wanted to talk about with these? Mm, no, not really. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, um, as we kind of mentioned, we have talked about Circle a little bit over the past few weeks. We, we first brought it up uh, when going over a blog post from Jean-Hid Benid uh, regarding his stood-in-bed proposal. Right. Um, yeah, and we, we briefly mentioned Circle in the context of that because you went ahead and just added an embed-like feature to Circle. Yep. And, uh, yeah, uh, and afterwards someone suggested we just have you on to talk more about Circle. So do you want to just uh, start off by telling us about what the Circle language actually is, what the compiler is? Sure. So um, when I had this idea four years ago when I started, um, was to take C++ as it is and then rotate it from the runtime onto the compile time axis. And so you could have essentially a, a, a runtime version of C++ programs and compile time versions that are interleaved, and you use a single token, which is the meta keyword, to distinguish if you want something to be compile time versus runtime, which is the default. So um, instead of trying to like add more core language mechanism and change semantics, my belief was that the semantics of C++ should be completely viable at compile time. So if you want to um, use a std vector, at compile time, you should just be able to use pound include vector and use std vector. So you do like meta std vector 
of int foo, and then you can manipulate it at compile time. So if you have a meta keyword in front of a, a declaration, that object that's declared has a compile time storage duration. If you have meta in front of a for statement, that becomes a compile time loop, which is really an unrolled loop. Um, and then the, the loop index is, is not constant, but it is compile time. So that loop index can be used as a case statement argument, or it can be used as a template argument, or it can be used um, as, a, as a bit field specifier, right? Um, what, I, what I realized was that um, const expert conflates two different things, which is constant constancy and compile timeness. And if, if you were to keep those things separate, and instead of trying to mark functions uh, that you want to be called at compile time at the at the function, but rather mark at the point of the call, then you can suddenly import, you know, 40 years of C++ and C libraries um, and have everything available at compile time. So, um, yeah, I, I just put meta in front of some some expression and it runs at a compile time. And, and this changes semantics in like a really nice way because uh, in ordinary C++ code, you can only put expression statements in block scopes. Right, in, in function. So you can't put an expression statement in a namespace because that namespace is really reserved for like static initializers or dynamic initializers. You can't put it inside of a class scope because classes, uh, class definitions don't have anything that can be executed, right? Same with enums. You can't put a printf inside an enum. But you can put a compile time version of these statements in any of those block scopes because suddenly a, uh, a printf in global namespace makes perfect sense. As you're translating that the source file and you hit a meta printf, just execute that printf and you can get hello in translation unit at compile time in your terminal as, as the compiler's running. Or you can do it inside of a class definition. Um, so it's, it really makes template metaprogramming very easy because now I can use ordinary algorithms. I can use std sort and std unique to create a unique list of types. Um, and I don't have to like create anything new. I can just use the existing infrastructure and I don't have to think about creating a set of partial template specializations that will through some kind of deduction magic, get me the solution I want. You can just you can program with the with the existing idiom. Um, and and what's cool is that once you have compile time control flow, once you have data driven, um, you know compile time if and compile time for, um, you can do useful things with information the compiler has always maintained but never exposed to you. So you can actually do useful things with introspection. So you know all compilers need to know what the names of your data members are and what their types are. But C++ doesn't provide you with that information because it doesn't give you enough compile time flexibility to do anything useful with it. But now since we have, we've kind of rotated C++ from the runtime time onto the compile time axis, I start exposing tons of um, compiler state that is um, available now through additional um, keyword extensions. So if you want to get the, the name of um, a non-static data member, you just use uh, member name, member underscore name. And it's, it's a keyword and it's um, an expression, and you pass it the type you want and the index of that of that, that data member. Or if you want um, all of the member names, you can just member names plural, and that returns a, a uh, parameter pack. And so during substitution, that parameter pack gets substituted, and you return for each element one of the, the member names. And so this makes it like you know really easy to use um, compile compile time information as data. And since we already have a full programming language being the C++ programming language, we can do useful transformations on that data. So then it became like really um, uh, fertile ground for, for new language development because suddenly I had a new set of data, which was, you know, compiler provided data about my translation unit. And I had a, a whole new set of tooling, which was C++, which is old, but it's new in this context. And so then you start thinking, well, what else can I do? And you add um, things like M-type, which is a uh, pointer-sized opaque data type that um, packs a type. So you can consider boxing any type into this M-type object, pass it around, you can put it into a std vector, you can sort it, you can put it into a map, and then you can unpack it. And all this works at compile time in this integrated interpreter. So if I want to, you know, like I said before, if you want to create a, um, a class template that creates a unique set of, of um, data members, like a, a unique tuple, I can just create a std vector of M-type, I can box all of the, the um, template parameter parameter types into um, this vector, and then I can std, std sort them, std unique them, and then I can um, back them back out with a keyword, and now I have a, a, a unique set, and I haven't done any template metaprogramming at all. I've just used std vector and, and STL. And um, just basic usage of the language to solve you know, pretty simple tasks prompts you for new, 
for new inventions. So it's been like, I have, you know, dozens of new language features and all these sort of presented themselves to me without much effort, just because I was working on such fertile ground. And once I've accepted this idea of separating, you know, constancy from compile timeness, and I realized I could use all of C++ and even system tools so I can make foreign function calls and access, um, you know, command line tools and, and, and whatever else I want to do to help kind of create my translation unit. So since you, well, the thing that you ended with is saying that you can call system calls and foreign functions and whatever, um, one of the complaints uh, about that in the C++ world would be that you would end up with two different translation units having two different values in them because two different calls to that system function return two different things, whatever. Like you opened a file, you get one value the first time, the next time you uh, compile that header or whatever, you get a different value. Do you, how does, how does that work? In your yeah, I, I would hope that would be the case because if you change the contents of a file, I mean, it should get a different value as you read it out again. So if you have data-driven translation, if you want to put configuration information in a JSON file and use that JSON file as an asset to drive translation, you're going to get obviously different um, executables every time you build or every time the, um, the underlying file changes. But you could say the same thing about headers. I mean, if you change a, a pound include, right, if you choose a header file, change a header and then recompile, obviously you're going to get different executables. Just this broadens the scope of what potentially is considered source. I guess to, what I'm saying, to, though, to any sort of asset. If, if that header file changes during compilation between two different translation units, then you have undefined behavior. You've probably broken one definition rule, something like that. I'm just saying if your underlying, whatever other system call that you're making, I'm compiling uh, two different files at once, or two different files in my build system, the first file includes some header file that does some work and it gets some result. The second file calls the same header file and gets a different result because there was a system call made inside that header file. Was that... Uh, why would... I don't know. Why Why would this asset be changing while you're building? I'm, I'm saying the possibility exists. This possibility exists of changing any source file while you're compiling. And if you have a single, if you have a header file included by multiple translation units, that could be changed during translation, during build as well. Um, right. I, I don't know. I think these are... I'm just asking, so would that be undefined, basically undefined behavior if that happened in your world? Same as if a header file changed, possibly. No, I, I, I don't know why it's undefined. Um, okay. Everything's deterministic there. If, if, if the contents of the file changes between building... TUA and TUB, mm -hmm. it's still defined. It's just TUB is going to have contents from a different, a different, um, and there's good, I mean, there's possible reasons to do that. I could definitely see a build tool wanting to treat some translation in differently than others. Um, people have hacked up all sorts of things. I'm not saying do that, but I, I'm, I'm not sure what the nature of this, I mean, this is like a very widely spread sentiment, but I'm not sure what the, what the fear is really, because as programmers, I think we're all like pretty comfortable opening files at runtime, mm -hmm. especially. And if we have Python tooling or whatever else, we do it during interpretation, which is quasi-compilation time. But the idea of opening a file at compile time scares people, and I, I don't understand why, because it's really no different than opening it at runtime. It's the same system. It's you know the same API. You can use like file star f equal f open and read the data out, or you can use um, JSON HPP or whatever you want and just use it responsibly. Don't try to build a trap and then step in it, I guess. Um, okay. No. I think the, the, you could say, well, there's a possibility of undefined behavior just mm -hmm. because C++ is full of things that, little edge cases that are possibly undefined. Mm -hmm. But just the, just the possibility of undefined behavior doesn't mean that you've contaminated your source, right? It's like, um, if you make wise choices, then you're not really exposed to this. If you use, I mean, how do we know we're not going to have memory leaks in our runtime? So it's because we use like std unique pointer or we use std vector, right? And, that, and therefore we, we um, protect ourselves from, from these dangers that are inherent in the language. And I would say use that same safe programming practice at compile time. Use a std vector, uh, use a std unique pointer. And, and you know, your, your resources are going to be managed appropriately that way at compile time. Okay. What uh, compiler are you building this on top of? Did you start off with Clang, or you? <coughs> no. 
what are you working with? Did you start something your on your own or blank blank file? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So um, I felt the. I mean, I looked at when I started. I looked at Clang. Really looked at Clang. And it's just so hard to modify. I mean, it's like well over a million lines. I don't know how big it is now. And, um, you know, you, you, everyone on Twitter who tries it, they end up writing some, like, lengthy blog about it. Like, you know, um, Quarantine did it, like, last month, like, or a couple weeks ago, yeah. about putting in a small modification. And, and then you, like, run up against, you know, some semi braced initializer routine that's, like, you know, 30,000 lines. And you're like, well, I don't know if I want to make huge modifications. And I've made, like you know, dozens of really deep modifications to, or additions to C++. And, and the idea of trying to to do that to Clang was, like, not appealing to me. So I wrote a new compiler from scratch. Um, I don't think compiler front-end work is very difficult. I think writing a C++ compiler from scratch is very difficult just because there's so much of it. But now that it's working, putting in new features is, like, really easy. And a lot of times it's just, I have something I want to achieve. Let's introduce a new AST type for it. It's only going to be a couple of lines. Um, let's introduce some modest grammar, and then you you know put a little like grammar rule in there, and it, it parses that out for you. No problem. I mean, I, a lot of stuff can go in an hour or two, um, especially when you keep doing it over and over and over again. I mean, a, a lot of C++ is the same formula, which is you know if there's any dependent arguments, then you're going to have to create like a special AST type, which which is you know type dependent, and then during substitution that'll you know, re-inject back into the expression builder and, and you, you replay this pattern so many times it becomes rote and you refactor your code and then it becomes like, you know, really powerful where, I mean, I, the, you mentioned the embed issue, like I put an embed keyword in, that was maybe like an hour and a half of work. Because, I mean, why should it be any more than that? You're just, you're just taking, you're taking a path and you're loading a file and um, you're exposing it as a kind of a, an array L value and then you've got the LLVM backend that just emits like a raw data um, field there. So it's, I don't think I would have had this flexibility if I were to stick with Clang just because Clang is so big. So you wrote your own front end, but to be clear from what you just said, you are using LLVM for your back end. Yeah, for code generation, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I would say technically I have two back ends, um, okay. and that's also why development was so good, which is the interpreter. So for the longest time, I would just be able to run any code in the interpreter. So, I mean, that makes it really easy because emitting LLVM code is quite difficult for C++ because of destructors and exceptions. So you always have like the exceptional path and then the, the kind of nominal path um, because of you know all the all the special stuff that that the compiler has to emit that the programmer doesn't see. But when you write an, um, an interpreter in C++ for C++, it's like super trivial because exception handling and destructors are done for you. So if all the objects with non-trivial destructors have a destructor in them that will like, you know, step through and clear out all the data members recursively, suddenly I don't have to do anything about exception handling in my interpreter. And it just becomes like a awesome platform for prototyping features. So we, I'm just guessing here, you like uh, directly executing the AST in your interpreter or? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep. That's, yeah. But that's, you just walk the AST. It's exactly like um, an L L of M code generator. You walk the AST and you either execute it or you emit you know, basic blocks and, and things. Right. That is the uh, uh, exact, I, well, not exact, but the same approach that I took with a scripting engine I've been working on that uh, uh, for a, a while, that it would, um, it directly executes the AST and then just let the C++ runtime take care of object lifetime and exceptions and everything like you just said, so I didn't have to worry about those deals. So yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's, that a, that's like a huge, that's a huge win that C++ has that kind of deterministic destruction. Right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, after you first introduced this uh, meta keyword rotating the access that you kind of had this fertile ground to introduce new features. What are some of the main features that Circle has that are, are not available in C++? Um, so a, a couple of them I took notes from... Um, people have proposals. So if there's a proposal, if, if I want to talk to someone and I get their attention um, and they have a proposal, that's great because then I'll like, Im um, you know, implement the proposal and then I can, I can talk to them. And so I did the pattern matching proposal. That's like uh, Michael Park and David Sankel. Mm -hmm. And that's why I met mm -hmm. David Sankel. So I implemented that. And then um, that's, if, you, if you're not aware what that is for everyone listening, it's, it's like um, a switch statement, except for you can have um, 
like a structured binding in the case. And so you can match out components of tuples or components of classes, and you can have filters, and you can have um, a, a pretty expressive kind of like domain-specific language for doing tests. And then the first case that matches is the one that gets returned. And so I put that in, and then that prompted me to do things like designated bindings. So instead of a structured binding that just matches by index, you can match .x or .y or .z, right? Um, wild cards, um, you know, deep referencing tools. And these kind of dovetail with, with pattern matching. I put in, um, from a compiler, I have um, injection from strings, which is, you know, a no-brainer if you have um, a kind of program or compiler like this. So I have a, a, an, an at expression keyword which takes a string known at compile time. It doesn't have to be a string literal. It can be a stood string that you glue together using you know whatever magic you want and you can inject the the expression by parsing this this input string. And so you, I mean you can certainly put in logic in a file that you load in at compile time and emit code, but really it's good for um, for injecting logic that's embedded in string. So I have a, a pretty long um, tutorial on my website or kind of example on how to build a, like a lib format or like a Python F string where you know you everyone likes printf because well, I like printf because it's um, concise and that it gives you um, you know the width and the um, precision modifiers and, and all of that's in like a really nice little language but it's not type safe and we have you know, the usual litany of complaints um, right. you know IO streams is really slow and it's it's not very concise. So, like, what's the what's the magic medium? And for me, it's being able to provide a single format specifier that has um, fields for um, precision and width, and and you know, if you want a capital lowercase e or you want a g or an f formatting or whatever. But then also to put the um, expression you want to print right there in the format specifier. So, you know, if you want to have um, if you want to print a, uh, a seven column wide float. You know, you could do like, um, you know, 7.f and then colon, and then you can put in the expression you want right there inside of inside the format specifier. And so how does that work? Well, um, my compiler, you, you, you can write a, a like a circle macro, which is a special kind of function, a special kind of injection tool. That macro gets this string as a compile time argument, and then it can use ordinary parsing techniques to to parse out the attributes from the expressions. And then it can inject that expression from a, from a string into the compiler, and that will evaluate the expression at the point of the, the uh, macro expansion. So essentially, you've got just like Python F strings, you can you can um, put a you can combine you can kind of create your own domain specific language, a formatting language that allows you to embed um, you know the expressions right there into the into the specifier, and then parse those out do some operations on the data, and then evaluate the embedded expressions. And you can do that through injection. So it, it just makes things really nicely. We can now have um, kind of functions that take in arguments in non-traditional ways. The problem, uh, one difficulty with lib format, for instance, is that it has format specifiers, but there's no way to check that the format specifier and the provided variadic arguments are compatible until a runtime because you can't actually parse the format specifier until runtime. So it ends there up packing. A, just for the record, there is compile time checking as well for the format. Well, it still, it still packs all of the um, uh, arguments into a, like a, a variant, right? And then uh, checks those against the... I'm not entirely sure how it's actually implemented, but you can, if you can get a compile time error, if you specify a compile time... Oh, really? It specifies a format that doesn't match the types passed in. Okay. Well, it just makes it not really easy this way now because again we have um, reflection and uh, variadic template subscript. Oh, we don't even have arguments. We just have this this format specifier, and it's it's easy to kind of introspect to compile time. Right. So there's really no question of how you would do it. I'm I'm trying to say. Right. Um, other things I have are like object and data member pack declarations. So um, I have like a one line tuple uh, a a a tuple class uh, template, which is just um, uh, it's a pack expansion, but instead of expanding like into an initializer list, you can expand into a class definition. Um, it's just like there's a lot of like really concise ways to do things that don't involve any loops or people nowadays don't really like loops as much for, for good reason. Um, and they want to use kind of this functional or like declarative approach. And I'm trying to do that with more of, um, you know, class definitions as well. 
Uh, if you don't mind, I want to go back to something uh, uh, earlier I forgot to ask about. Um, you were talking about uh, implementing a C++ parser and compiler. Just out of curiosity, like how much of C++ do you actually support right now? I don't I don't think I support all of 17. I don't support yet um, uh, deduction guides on uh, std initializer list, which is like pretty obscure. I support deduction guides, but only on constructors and not on the braced initializer list version of the constructors. I haven't gotten around to that. Okay. Um, is that it? I'm not missing. I'm not sure what else I'm missing from C++ 17, if anything. Uh, as far as 20, I have um, concepts, which are pretty easy, actually, to, to, to implement. And then I have Spaceship. There's no, like, test for Spaceship yet. Um, I'd like to do coroutines, but I'm looking for more guidance on kind of ABI concerns and, and what it actually means. I, I guess GCC... 10 just came out with coroutines merged now. Oh, so I might. I thought it was just like this week or last week. Oh, so if that's, yeah, it hasn't been released yet, but I didn't know it had oh, been merged. Okay. I, yeah, but no, but I didn't even know it had been merged. So yeah. Right. I, so when there's guidance on on how to do coroutines, because that is like that really ripples down to the back end in a big way. Then I'll, right. I'll add that. Um, yeah, I haven't made a pass through the C plus plus 20 draft yet, but oh, most of the sure. stuff in the C plus plus 20 draft is pretty modest, uh, except for like modules and coroutines, which I find are the the hard ones. It, like um, in a hypothetical, if I had like a C plus plus fourteen project right now, should I be able to compile with your compiler? Yeah, yeah. I okay. mean, there's a few things I don't support that are non-standard. Like, um, I I parse the AVX intrinsics, but I don't emit backend code for them. Things like that. Um, but th that's not really part of standard C plus plus. Right. You know, that's just busy work really to, have to <laughs> find all those LLVM intrinsics, well, thousands of them. Um, yeah. So. Uh, for my, my my test case right now is I mean the biggest one that I added in I guess November is um, range v3. There's like 212 tests in range v3, and there and I, I compile those with C++ 20 concepts. So those all compile and build, and that was like definitely the the biggest torture test I faced. <laughs> um, just because like I had to do special logging of all the concepts it evaluates because there's so much like concept use on like is this type like semi-regular or whatever and it goes on and I like this, these huge dumps and figure out like which concept evaluated true or false when it should have done the other and so that, that exposed a couple of bugs I had especially in like the type traits you know is like is x trivially constructible from y that kind of that kind of stuff but um, yeah so I, I try to use a lot of like really forward looking um, things in my regression tests I have uh, my Hana's compile time regular expression code mm -hmm. that, that compiles fine although that code's not not actually crazy um, and then I, I, I compile some of my own translation units. I don't have a, a bootstrapping compiler. I don't. I haven't contaminated the Circle source code with Circle, because that's like I think that's insane. And I understand people from other languages do it, but it doesn't make sense for C plus plus compiler to <laughs> to try to bootstrap itself anymore. Um, yeah. So it's just I just have like normal C plus plus fourteen or seventeen source code for the Circle source. And it's also Circle goes through such feature churn. Like I'm constantly removing and adding features, so it wouldn't make sense to to do that. That just leads me to like three other questions. <laughs> uh, if uh, so, my understanding, and I could be completely wrong on this, is that is at least some of the modern C++ compilers do some transformations on the AST uh, for optimizations before they pass it off to like the LLVM backend. So just like out of curiosity, like. Have you compared, like, does the circle compiler generate, a, like, approximately the same optimized code that Kling does for the same input? Well, Kling, Kling uses its own proprietary blend of flags and spices, I guess. Right. Um, so I use, like, the default. Well, I just use the default 01, 02, or 03 mm -hmm. settings. So, yeah, it should be. I don't actually believe Kling does real source transformations. I thought they did something. I mean, it could be completely off base. So like, I'm not I think everyone that. does some constant folding. And certainly if you have like a const x per function call in an expression, it'll, it'll want to fold that and I fold that. But I, I'm not sure what, what other operations it would do. Um, okay. I just don't know what, you know, you can, do, it's a lot easier for the back end to optimize than it is for the front end. It's like once you get into that like three address code, that like single static assignment code, Right. It just becomes a graph problem, and then you can say, well, like, these two edges are going from the same source to the same destination, and collapse them and merge, and, like, it becomes, like, a really easy problem. And that's why LLVM has been pretty successful, because, like, they reduced it to a, a attack that's really easy to attack, to, to process. And I wouldn't really want to do very much in the AST. 
That's fair. Um, you mentioned that you're constantly adding and removing features as you're playing with things. Uh, would there be a way for me as a user of Circle to say, well, I you know, am relying on features X and Y, make sure that they are enabled or disabled these features that for whatever reason have gotten in my way or something like that? Like, do you have flags for any of these things? Just uh, no, but I don't, I don't have users who talk to me either. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am the only user. Um, I wish it were not the case. I wish there was like interest in, in doing something with this. But right now, it's 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 me. Um, some people, you know, I mean, there's there's been some interest, and in, in people have looked into it for writing some papers or, or doing talks or whatever. But, um, you know, the the core language just seems pretty stable. Like the okay. things I've really been refactoring are like macros, um, some of the injection stuff. But, um, yeah, I I don't I don't have a problem adding new features if people just if someone just asked me like. They ask me about embed, and I say, yeah, I'll put it in embed. I, you know, it's no big deal. Um, I haven't. I don't know if I would want to remove any features yet. Okay. Um, yeah, I did just also. I, I just this last week. This week, I finally um, dropped the list comprehension feature, which is I think the biggest transformation to the core C++ language in in ages. It's like I'm really pretty amped about that. Um, can we talk about that right now? Yeah, sure. go for it. Go ahead. So one of the things that Python people have been, you know, posting about since the beginning was that Python has list comprehension. So you just have like a square bracket and then you can put um, a for loop inside that with a filter or you can put some slices in there and it will, you know, expand these guys out and create a list for you. And the Python list is like a standard uh, uh, C++ vector, basically. And um, yeah, it's really it's really nice and it's really expressive. And they have a point. And the C++ answer was to do ranges. And ranges doesn't have the concision, and it's not a, a language built in. Um, and so it takes a long time to build, and then the compiler errors are, are really scary. And I think it provides um, kind of a, a logic that's difficult to get your head around. And certainly no replacement for list comprehension. So um, last month, this is like only like six weeks ago now, I said, what I'm going to do is use the existing infrastructure laid out by uh, C++ 11 parameter packs. So if you have a parameter pack, there's um, an implicit bit held by the compiler, which is this is a parameter pack, right? And it's only going to materialize a real value or yield a real value during temp substitution. Okay. But other than that, it's just like an expression. So if you have like a, a non-type parameter pack of ints, so int dot 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 my ints that you feed to a function or if you do a class, and you reference those things, that returns a PR value int, right? It's, an, it's a real integer. It's not some, some wrapper. It's not like a range T around int. It's, a, it's an int. And so it can do overload resolution, and you can add these things together. You can do whatever you want to do on expressions of that type and, and of, of that result object. So I said, OK, what if I were to kind of run with that um, pack bit, add a second pack bit, which is the dy dynamic pack property, and then allow you to turn any container into a parameter pack, which is dynamic, though. So um, what I did is I, I introduced a slice syntax, which is like the square bracket with a begin, colon, end, colon, step, which mm -hmm. is the exact same syntax you get in Python. I think Fortran has it. I think, I think maybe. Mat I think yeah. MATLAB has it. I mean, they're like kind of different as far as like the ordering. But the idea here is that you have a, a, begin, in a begin index an end index and a step and the step can be like positive or it can be negative to go from right to left order okay okay so now what happens is you use a container and you use this uh pack so the the simplest pack not uh, uh, slice notation is just square bracket colon so it's one colon and then the begin is is assumed to be zero and the end index is, be, is assumed to be negative one which is the one past the last element now that transforms this std vector from type std vector to type whatever the inner type is, right? And how do you how do you uh, how do you arrive at that inner type? Well, you you call like the dot uh, the begin member function that returns an iterator, and then you um, dereference it with star, right? So that's the same thing that range based for uh, range four does. So by using a slice, I've transformed any STL container, anything that has begin and end iterators, mm -hmm. into a parameter pack. Now the type has changed to whatever the dereferenced iterator type is. So that'll be like an L value int if you have a std vector of ints. And now um, because 
it's not like a, a, I haven't done a range wrapper around that that inner type. I have the inner type is available by itself, even though it's implicitly a pack. I can add them together. I can pass them to functions. So if I pass uh, this slice operator to printf, right? Well, printf has like an integer return uh, result uh, return object result object. So now that printf call is itself a pack, and I can add it to other things. So you can create these big expressions have a whole bunch of uh, slices in them and you can expand them out. When you expand, the compiler will generate a for loop. So it, it, it says, well, I've got, um, I've got one dynamic pack in this expression. I'm going to create a new little like stack frame. I'm going to call it dot begin. I'm going to call it dot end. I'm going to advance the begin iterator forward. I'm going to advance the end iterator backwards if I'm stepping left to right, depending on if step is positive or negative, right? And then I'm going to generate a, a, a loop that will visit each element in this pack it could step three elements between or whatever the step size is, right? And then it'll, it, it executes that expression. So um, you can think of the slice operator as a, as a dynamic pack generator. It's something that will like generate a loop. And then the consumer is the kind of embodiment of the loop. So the consumer in this case can be a regular expansion expression. So let's say I want to printf all of the values of a, of a vector to, this, to the terminal at once, right? You see printf, quote, um, percentage D, end quote, comma, V, uh, square bracket, colon, uh, end parentheses, dot, 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 semicolon, right? And so the dot, dot, dot at the end is uh, a pack expansion into an expression. So it's, what it okay. does is it converts the result object. The result object of printf is int. It converts that to, to void. It's a discard, right, like any expression statement is. And then it generates a, a for loop. And so now, what if I want to print the back, the result of the, uh, the the contents of a vector in reverse order, right? It's the same thing, but now the slice is v square bracket colon colon minus one, which is right to left reversal. It's reverse order traversal. What if I want to do only the odd elements? It's one colon colon two. So start at offset one, don't have an end an explicit end, and then two is skip every other element, right? And so now what you've done is you've ordered up. You have like like this amazing, really expressive syntax for saying I want to visit a container in some order and the container could be anything it could be a std map it can be any kind of type that has um, not not even random access but but any forward or, or reverse access iterator because it used std advance internally if it has to go more than one step or plus plus or minus minus right um, and then if you want to do list comprehension this is like the, the best part of it is that you know you can expand these things into an expression but if you expand them into a list so just use square brackets people think square brackets have to be lambdas but if it doesn't, if it's not followed by like parentheses or arrow or whatever the, the grammar is for lambdas, I interpret that as a list comprehension. So now put a complicated expression involving one or more containers into the square brackets and then put dot, dot, dot inside the square brackets, right? And so now that's a list comprehension. The result object of that list comprehension is a std vector. It's specialized okay. over whatever type is inferred from the contents, right? And then it gets mm -hmm. returned. So if I want to... Um, Say I have a let's say I have a, a std vector of ints, and I say um, uh, square bracket v uh, square bracket dot times two dot 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 and square bracket right. So I, what I've just done is created a slice that will loop over every element of v, multiply it by two, and then I expand that into a new std vector. And so when the compiler generates code for this, it will it will uh, create a new std vector. It will count how many elements it expects to see. It'll reserve that much memory. It'll step through, and then it'll populate the std vector and return it. And what's even better is now the std vector, it is a regular PR value std vector, but it's also a list comprehension AST node, which means it's implicitly convertible to an initializer list. So if I want to initialize a string, std string, std string has an initializer list constructor. Yes. It does not have a std vector constructor. Uh, std map has an initializer list constructor. Std any, any pretty much any any STL container other than like array has an initializer list constructor. So this will um, this the list comprehension provides the backing store, which is dynamic memory required to hold the contents of the initializer list of some dynamic length. We don't know what the length is at compile time because heap allocation is used. It 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 um, creates that uh, std vector. It does a materialization on it to turn it into a, like an expiring x value, and then it returns a or it yields an initializer list with a pointer into that data. And so now we can have kind of universal list comprehension initializers for any STL types. And I have, I have this um, very long document on GitHub with all the other circle stuff that has 
like hundreds of examples on how to how to do text manipulation. So how do I take one string and say, you know, alternate capitalization or double characters or whatever you do, things that are shown as as um, STL ranges or um, you know C plus plus range examples, but now entirely in this new list comprehension syntax and without any additional function calls. The point is that there's no function calls required. Everything's um, accelerated by the compiler itself, and so there's no Sturm und Drang over the design of the interface. A lot of the problems people have with STD transform and STD for each whatever else is that there's a specific interface and you have to cohere that interface. Transform will visit every element between the begin and end pairs, but what if you want to have visit two arrays simultaneously? You have to create a zip iterator. What if you want to step every other step every other element? You have to create a step iterator. Now, what if you want to do both? What if you want to um, step and zip? We have to make sure we have the step and the zip iterator composable. Do we use pipes to compose them? Do we use composition? And it becomes like a huge question because what we wanted to do is express an algorithmic desire through a function, but that function has to have a specific um, interface. By doing everything in the language with list comprehension in these dynamic packs, I avoid all that. I don't. I never have to create a lambda for this stuff, right? Because it's. I'm not. I'm not trying to ship my my special functionality, capture scope through this closure, and then pass it to another function where it'll be invoked again. If I want to do a reduction, I have. Um, you know, like C plus plus seventeen has fold expressions, mm -hmm. which is like dot 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 plus some container. So I've expanded that to work with dynamic packs. So you can do dot 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 plus v square bracket colon, which is like the slice of V, and that'll add up all the elements in a container at runtime, right? Um, that I can put any expression in there. I can, it's not just slice of V. I could say, um, find me the max of these, uh, the difference of two elements, right? So I have, I have um, vectors A and B, and I want to find the, the max difference of two elements, right? So there it's just dot, 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 stood max, um, parentheses, a slice minus b slice. Now, that'll find me the, 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 the maximum of, all of the element-wise differences. But if I want to do that with, with STL, I'd have to create a lambda function that encloses that behavior of a minus b. And then I have to figure out a way to get the, the current iterators from a and b to that lambda, right? And like, that's an interfacial problem, and that's why we have concepts. We just have to make sure that, that these different requirements are composable. But when you build this functionality right into the language, that all washes away. I don't worry about interface anymore, and I don't have to worry about closures because there's nothing to close. This is all written in line. And so I think from like a, um, an immediacy argument, you know, it's, it's much easier, it's much better to have a rich core language of C++ um, because you don't worry about interface. And that's what's been killing C++. When you look at STL code, it's like there's, you know, there's a zillion constructors in every type now. Every type has an explicit, non-explicit one. There's you know, there's, there's so many enable if statements. There's just so much stuff now because people worry about composability, but composability is not a problem when you're just dealing with individual expressions. So my, my push for this is to make the language as expressive as possible so you don't worry that you're not worried about calling libraries and how to use libraries. So if I could make the uh, completely, let's see, ignorant, I have no idea because I've never actually tried this, um, uh, feature request for your list comprehension, it would be, if I understood you correctly, this is what I would like to see. If the size of the list being uh, built is known at compile time, like it's coming from a std array, then the backing store itself be a compile time sized thing like a std array. So then for systems that can't do dynamic memory for whatever reason, it could still work with your list comprehensions. Yeah, um, I thought about doing that. Um, if you have a, right now the slice operator always returns a dynamic pack. Right. If it were to return a static pack, it would work because um, list comprehension is just, it just it includes a, a regular initializer list in it. So you can do a, um, if you have a non-type template parameter pack, you can expand a non-type pack in that, right? Because okay. You know, you can compose it of multiple things. It can be a slice expression, and it'll it'll go through the whole slice expression, comma, some scalars, comma, uh, static pack exp expansion. You're talking about a static ex static pack expansion. It it would make sense. I agree to put in a slice operator that allows you to. Oh wait a minute, I have that. Shoot, I have I. I'm not sure if it works for that or not. I do have a slice operator on template packs. I forgot about that. Dot 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 slice. And so okay. if I want to if I if I'm giving a a, a non-type parameter pack. And I want to only like get the even elements. 
I can do dot, 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 um, bracket, colon, colon, two, which skips every other one. Interesting. And that, that transforms the original pack into another pack. But now this pack essentially only presents half the elements to me. So then if the original pack had size 10, the new pack has size 5. Right. So when the new pack is expanded, it essentially multiplies each element by 2 or each index request. So it would, yeah, obviously, um, I, I think it would make sense to expand, to extend dot, 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 pack syntax to things like tuples or anything tuple-like, right? Because there's that thing where um, for structured binding, if you have a, a class type or a std array yeah. or a std tuple or a, is that it, uh, pair? It's a pair, tuple, array, yeah. And those are all implemented with uh, standard library hooks. Tuple size, so tuple element, possible, yeah. yeah. Right, so I, I think yeah, that's a good feature request. I think it would make sense for me to check if the incoming expression is not a parameter pack and you use that, the static, uh, static slice syntax, then to try to attack it as if it were a tuple or a tuple-like structure. Right. Right, because that would work with std array, right? Yeah, yes, it should. I, I okay. believe so. I mean, I, if I understood everything that you said about how it's implemented, then I'm pretty sure it sounds like it would work. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, all things are possible, right? It just requires someone to say, uh, "Let's let's do it," as opposed to, I don't know, sniping at other people's proposals. I don't know. It's like I just want to. I don't really write proposals. I just write a compiler, and that's why I've got so much done. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm the one who decides if it goes in or not. So yeah, I'll probably put it in. Well, then I would like to make two other feature requests while I'm at it. The first would be oh, a boy. pull request to Compiler Explorer so that it's possible to play with your compiler on Godbolt.org which should not be difficult to do. Uh, maybe. Okay. I, <laughs> I, it's just, it's hard for me to like support. Maybe it's identical. Maybe, maybe behave identically, but like, I don't really have any support team. I mean, it's I have one person, so I'm, I'm not sure if I want to put it out in multiple formats like that. I, uh, I don't know what it actually takes to integrate it, but. Oh yeah. It's, it's actually really simple to integrate a, a, a different compiler. Like if you look right now, godbolt.org supports like, okay. 15 different programming languages uh, to giving it another front end. Assuming, assuming building it is no more difficult than building Clang, then it should be pretty straightforward, single pull request, and it would get built nightly automatically. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and the other, well, okay, then you're, you're definitely going to disagree with my next feature request, I'm pretty sure, which I don't blame you. But it would be cool to see the chart of features that you do support from C++ on the compiler um, uh, uh, CVP reference compiler compatibility chart. How is that compatibility? That's not an automatic thing? That's just a It is not thing. an automatic thing. People just go in and update the table on... Okay. Uh, it's a um, Wikipedia, basically, Wikimedia. Oh, thing. right. So that just gives you, like, a proposal number for each of the features and... Yeah, and, and the, the whole thing is already built out right now. It would just be checkboxes for your compiler. Yeah, that would be good. I'd probably find some things I forgot about. Um, mm. I mean, right now, my, my test case is, like, all of the STL, which is, like, libstandard C++ 9. That's like, I don't know, 100 files in there. It's like 220,000 lines, and there's range v3 and some other ones. But I'm sure there's some <laughs> there's some constructs that aren't used by any of those that are still in the language, I guess. I oh, and I, I might be able to save you some effort with Compiler Explorer if we try it really nicely, because when Matt listens to this episode, if we say, <laughs> Matt, it would be awesome to see Circle on Compiler Explorer, he might do it if it's not that difficult, and you might not have to do anything. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So one more question I have before we let you go is, you know, you just said a moment ago how uh, you don't write, you know, ISO papers, you're writing a compiler, but there are a whole bunch of ISO papers that seem to be, you know, uh, taking a look at Circle. Um, are you hoping that Circle does inspire changes in the C++ language? Like, what what is your goal with Circle? My goal is to get some material support and be able to put this out in some form. Now, if that means... Like it's a, um, you know, C++ compiler that sort of kind of pushes ahead of the standard. That would be, my goal is to get it, to get it used and to get, to get some other support on it because I'm like super exhausted and I need some, <laughs> some other people to make it worthwhile. But it's a, it's a great piece of software. It's about twice as fast as Clang. I put another um, um, uh, benchmark up last night. It shows like 2.3 times faster than Clang, like 15 times faster than MSVC in, in the large array initializer. XSD benchmark that um, Carnton was kind of working on before. Um, you know, it's it's a fast compiler and, I, and it's easy to use and it's great for prototyping. And I I kind of wish that 
the C++ community would engage with me and say, well, like, this would be a great platform for prototyping all of our proposals because arguing over PDF files is like not it's not satisfying to me. I don't think it re leads to good results. And if if people had a path for getting stuff implemented in a real compiler in the course of weeks as opposed to years, um, that would kind of give the iteration and, and speed and um, proactiveness that C++ needs to stay competitive and to become a better better language. I mean, I, I want the code to be used. I forget what the original question was. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, just just what are what are your goals with it? Are you hoping that C plus plus you know becomes more like Circle in the future, or are you seeing it as its own separate thing that you hope people use instead of C plus plus? I guess my hope is that it C plus plus would become like Circle, but I don't have confidence in that. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's like a lot of um, personalities in the committee, and there's just so many people, and a lot of for a lot of people, like the fight is is the attraction. Like the idea of going to quarterly meetings and then duking it out is is a career. And <laughs> I mean, they they just like that 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 level of I, they like the process. And I don't think that process would get through the the really extensive challenges that this compiler is making. I mean, even that the question is like, what is a compiler? And Circle is like re -ask, reframing that because it's like simultaneously a compiler and an interpreter, right? It's its own scripting language. And that's something that the committee is just, it's not really ready to deal with, especially when it's looking at proposals that have, you know, very small changes about const expert if scope or whatever, right? I mean, this is like navel gazing time. And I, I don't know, think, I don't think the committee with hundreds and hundreds of, of members is ready to, to, to go through all of this. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But right now, my hope is that I can get funding and, and Microsoft or Google will say, yeah, maybe we should like talk to this guy. I can't even get talks at companies. I've, I always try and I haven't actually given a talk at a company, a, a real talk since like July. I just kind of given up. I mean, I kept trying Microsoft and they said, you know, no, the employees wouldn't even stand up for me. So hmm. I don't know. I've tried Google a bunch of times and then, you know, get dead ends. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I think this is great stuff. Nobody's trying to recruit me. I gave, a, I did give a, a talk to um, Herb and Bjarna and uh, Chandler in November, which was good. Mm. Okay. Pretty much everyone on SG7. It was like maybe like seven people, eight people. But, you know, so I, I have like two hours. I went through all the features and it was, you know, great stuff. But, you know, where do they go from there? It's not clear. Um, right. You know, it's like I, you know, I gave like SG7 like all this, this content and like, there's really no, there's really no like urgency to implement it. So, or it's even talk to me about getting access to the technology. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't really have a plan going forward. I, my dream when I started was that if I build a really an amazing tool, that good things will happen. And I built the tool, and I'm I'm still waiting for the good things to happen. So, <laughs> well, it's been great having you on the show today. Yeah. I mean, it definitely seems like powerful compiler and uh i hope some good things do happen maybe some yeah. people who haven't heard about it before will, will yeah this is doing out. things like we'll this see. is so is so essential for me i'm really thankful because it's it's really critical for me to get the the word out yeah, yeah that's where i think uh having it on the compatibility chart on cvp reference would be i haven't big. yeah thanks i haven't i haven't even considered that i didn't know that was a thing even so yeah because people looking at that chart will be like hey wait a minute what's this other compiler that supports all of these features too cuz right now there's really only three options for a yeah. compiler that supports C++17 so mm -hmm. yeah okay thanks so much okay. John hey thanks guys yeah thanks for coming on uh